thank you very much. Uh, thanks for okay, coming and listening to me. And uh, so, yes, today I will talk uh, about a somewhat uh, academic topic, but uh, we'll see that it will lead to uh, much more interesting results later. So uh, this talk is based on uh, four uh, papers. Some of them are accepted already. The second one was accepted a couple of days ago. Uh, and while there are other two papers which are still in progress, but uh, well, they are progressing quite fast. So we're looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, yes, so I will start with the motivation. Then I will briefly describe this uh, formalism of uh, geometric optics. Uh, and uh, then I will uh, introduce a couple of observables uh, that we could, uh, could define and uh, well define uh, well enough and uh, to have them um, measurable and uh, afterwards i will switch to exact methods where i'm uh, trying to focus more and uh, this yeah lastly i will uh, uh, dwell into uh, geometric optics in uh, short space time and then uh, conclude with some much larger uh, conclusion so uh, what, what's the uh, motivation? Well, of course, uh, we have a, a constant improvement in observations. Uh, uh, for, for a long time, well, we had access mostly to uh, some, so in a sense, a static uh, form of data. Well, if we consider uh, uh, large scale or cosmological scale uh, observations, and uh, therefore it was, uh, sufficient to apply the uh, uh, formalism, uh, so-called uh, Zach's formalism that was established in the 1960s. And uh, for a long time, it, it was it, it was and it still is very successful in uh, providing, uh, well, connecting data and uh, theory. However, uh, it is incomplete in a sense that it is lacking uh, uh, effects such as a parallax effect also it, it does not really take into account uh, uh, variations in time especially if we are uh, considering uh, variations to extended periods of time and this could uh, be for, and this uh, would correlate uh, would be related to uh, observables such as uh, the redshift drift or uh, the position drift which are uh, changes of these quantities in time and uh, then the question is, uh, what can we do to implement, uh, to co collect all of this and uh, write and explain it in a coherent manner? So uh, this is where uh, what's, uh, what is one of main our group's work is to uh, write, is to establish and, uh, and give grounds to a formalism that would not only take into account all these uh, optical observations and effects, but also uh, uh, to uh, well to see what can we learn about the geometry itself, because we know that in uh, measurements uh, the pure effects of geometry are often plagued with the effects of peculiar velocities. So uh, sometimes uh, we have a degeneracy between the geometrical effects and uh, say aberration or special relativistic effects. So this is what uh, we were trying to work on. And uh, so let's uh, give some geometrical uh, ground to this. Uh, so consider a four dimensional space time uh, and uh, pick any two points uh, well in a reasonably well behaved uh, neighborhoods and uh, that can be small enough for the curvature effects to be negligible and uh, so first what we want is that these neighborhoods uh, could be connected by a, uh, at least one null geodesic and uh, yes we also demand that uh, it's, this connection uh, is unique namely that there are no multiple uh, lensing effects so Yes, we consider two neighborhoods connected with a null geodesic, and then we ask what happens when we uh, slightly perturb the initial conditions of, uh, the, of this geodesic. So uh, we uh, displace one of the endpoints by some, uh, well, either we displace in space 
or we uh, slightly change the uh, well the direction uh, at which it's uh, traveling and uh, well of course uh, the propagation of light is uh, described mainly by Maxwell equations however in practice uh, it is uh, often sufficient uh, well it, it is sufficient to uh, use a much simpler geometric optics uh, uh, formalism but of course it requires uh, certain assumptions so one assumption is that the uh, the wavelength of the uh, electromagnetic wave has to be much shorter than the uh, characteristic uh, curvature radius of the space-time and uh, yes and then what is more uh, since we're considering only nearby geodesics uh, then we uh, we have to write down uh, we have to make an, an extra assumption because uh, in general uh, the behavior of uh, distinct geodesics is well non-local one so if we really want to uh, write down how these really neighboring geodesics uh, behave with respect to each other we have to uh, uh, well, demands that given that the this deviation and its derivative are small enough, then uh, we can write this down. Uh, if we can write down this effective equation as uh, the one uh, at the top. So this is so-called uh, geodesic deviation equation, or uh, sometimes also called as a Jacobi field equation. And uh, yeah, here we have the psi vector which uh, connects the neighboring uh, points on the geodesics, and R is the uh, Riemann curvature tensor. So at the moment, everything is expressed in uh, some coordinate frame. So we have, uh, uh, well, we simply use the the, the, the coordinates, uh, the simple coordinates. Then uh, to connect it to our, uh, uh, to, to a practical, uh, to our, to practice, uh, we relate the initial conditions to these deviations as they were presented uh, in the previous slide. So we have uh, the, uh, its values and derivatives, uh, well, and at both endpoints uh, uh, defined as follows. And since this equation is linear, we can express the net result in terms of a linear operator. So, uh, and for this reason, we introduced these so-called uh, bilocal geodesic operators or uh, w operators which uh, work uh, something like uh, transfer matrices or if anyone uh, remembers uh, classical optics this would be the abcd matrices so uh, these matrices uh, tell us uh, uh, well they relate the various deviations at both endpoints and so uh, yes and now the question is uh, okay we have these operators but how can we, uh, well, how do we connect them to the experiment? So uh, to, uh, uh, so in this example, we'll uh, discuss uh, the uh, so-called so uh, well, gravita gravitational magnification uh, effects and parallax effects. So the first effect, the magnification is, uh, is basically, well, this matrix really uh, describes how uh, how the physical uh, transversal side of the source uh, is related to its angular size as seen by the observer. So uh, this is now a two-dimensional problem. So uh, that's why we have the bold Latin letters. So it means that we only consider uh, directions uh, perpendicular to the uh, geodesic and uh, Yes, and then we try to relate these quantities uh, uh, somehow. And in a similar way, we can ask, we can uh, ask, what about the parallax? Because parallax is also, uh, well, it is a, another another thing that at least we all experience in uh, daily life. Now, of course, in uh, astrophysical astronomical observations, it is much more difficult. Uh, so. But still, it's a nice uh, example of uh, observable that uh, is well grounded. So, so what what's the point? Why do we introduce these operators? So, in case in flat uh, space time, we have a flat space time. 
these uh, two uh, operators would provide the same distance measure. So uh, for example, look at the picture on the left. So we have this uh, uh, source, the body of the source, and it has uh, for, well, some uh, size of, uh, of order B. And then we measure its, uh, we measure its angular size as well as uh, we measure its displacement as the observer displaces itself. And we, well, we use the classical trigonometry to uh, find out what is the distance uh, we assign to uh, such configuration. And in, in Euclidean case, uh, or in flat case, uh, these two distances match. However, if there is uh, some curvature in between, so we have uh, in the presence of matter or uh, some more uh, severe objects in the way, uh, then these uh, two distances will not match anymore. So, and this is uh, one of the largest problems in uh, general relativity or curve geometry in general is that uh, every notion of distance is, uh, is, in is independent or all, all these notions, there's no one correct no uh, distance notion of distance. All of them tell us something different about the uh, geometry in between these uh, two endpoints. And so maybe there is a way to connect all these distances we acquire and see if we can say something about the nature of the space-time geometry. And then, so now we have these matrices, but of course we want some measure of distance. And so we don't have to think uh, very hard. So uh, for uh, we, we know that at least the magnification matrix is uh, well, it's it is related to the angular diameter distance. So uh, as I said, uh, you uh, there is a source of a known uh, size. Well, uh, how we know it is a different problem. But suppose we know the size of the object, and then it is placed somewhere far away from us. And we measure its angular size, and uh, that's where uh, well, and uh, the ratio uh, and, and these two quantities allow us to find out the area. So we can or the distance. So we can measure the distance. And on the other hand, we have the distance expressed in terms of, in terms of these operators, meaning that uh, uh, we can also uh, calculate it. So everything is uh, connected. In a similar way, we. Uh, introduce a parallax distance uh, uh, again through these determinants because uh, well, determinants usually corresponds to areas and uh, it is easier to and at least for angular diameter distance these uh, this definition also uh, is connected to the flux of energy which uh, has to flow through an area a cross-sectional area so uh, in a similar sense we introduce a parallax distance but now instead we have uh, the source in a fixed position and at the uh, observer side, we have a family of observers who are uh, spanning a certain uh, uh, physical area. And now the question is, <clears throat> uh, what is the parallax? What kind of parallax we are measuring? So, uh, so every observer is, uh, well, they are co-moving, but uh, they are not moving during the, uh, the exact uh, observation. So instead, what they do is that all of them, uh, well, first of all, they align their uh, coordinates in the sky, and then each of them uh, uh, notes the position of this luminous source. And then uh, all these images are uh, superimposed onto each other, and uh, this uh, contour, uh, well, creates an, uh, a shape which has in some certain angular size. And uh, again, uh, from the from the physical area spanned by the observers and from this uh, angular area of this con uh, shape uh, bounded by the contour, we can measure the parallax distance. And on the other hand, we can uh, calculate it uh, again using uh, our W operators. And uh, of course, uh, angular diameter distance uh, is not that measurable for uh, really large distances. So instead it is, uh, replaced thanks to a relation to a luminosity distance. So now 
as long as we know the redshift and we can measure the flux of light, uh, we can infer the angular diameter distance. Um, but uh, now, uh, well, the first big novelty of our formalism is uh, such a parameter mu, which is uh, in a sense a curvature detector because uh, it is possible to define it uh, in such a way that uh, these special relativistic effects uh, cancel out, meaning that uh, anything that happens uh, along this geodesic is uh, or, uh, that uh, affects the mu, the parameter mu, is uh, really only due to the curvature along the line of sight. And uh, okay, here is a typo. And uh, so using the expressions before, well, uh, so we are here relating uh, the parallax matrix and the magnification matrix. But uh, instead, we can actually replace it in, with uh, the distances. So previously, we have introduced the angular diameter distance and the parallax distance. So we measure them, we square them, we take the ratio, and uh, this way we calculate mu. Well, uh, there's uh, this sigma parameter, which uh, uh, for uh, short distances, it's uh, positive, but it, uh, it may change its sign in very strong uh, deflection uh, cases. But, uh, well, in practice, this is, uh, well, it does not happen that often. So, <clears throat> so what is nice is that this mu is not in itself that complicated. Uh, actually, we can express it only in terms of uh, one of these operators. So uh, again, uh, we, can, uh, we can measure something, uh, some, sign of curvature in a very isolated way and we can also uh, calculate it from our uh, formalism and uh, well for short distances uh, this uh, mu corresponds to uh, amount of matter uh, along the line of sight but uh, we'll make a more precise statement in the uh, in the future so now uh, a few words about exact methods so of, of course uh, exact solutions on one hand are uh, well, they may be too simplistic in, in most of cases. However, uh, we know that uh, some uh, widely used models uh, of uh, compact bodies or of, uh, I, I don't know, uh, types of universes, uh, at least at the uh, zeroth order, are well explained by uh, exact models, exact solutions. And uh, on one hand, you can use them to check numerical codes. On the other hand, uh, you, can, you can start there to uh, and add perturbations on top of it. And uh, well, now what is nice about uh, the deviation equation is that uh, it is linear. If you recall, it was in, uh, well, a system of second order ordering differential equations, meaning that uh, this, uh, there is always uh, a well-defined solution and now the question is uh, if, if we have any intuition behind it and uh, of course in general these functions are arbitrary but well uh, given sufficient symmetry uh, maybe we can integrate them uh, completely and uh, conclude something without uh, working with these uh, strange functions so now i'll present a couple of method methods of uh, solving these equations so first one is so is very brute force methods, uh, which is also uh, bound to work every time. Uh, so suppose you, at first that you're uh, give, you're given a geodesic. So you have uh, the behavior of all the coordinates of uh, along the geodesic uh, as functions of the uh, initial data. So the position, the derivative, and the affine parameter uh, along this geodesic. And uh, what we do here is uh, reminiscent of uh, the methods used in uh, thermodynamics. So if you recall uh, thermodynamic potentials, and uh, if you recall it, it, all these uh, exact derivatives or total derivatives and partial derivatives, uh, well, this is very similar what we do here. So first we uh, fix some coordinate system. So uh, this is of course coordinate dependent, but once we fix the coordinate system, uh, well, what we can do is we can simply uh, vary these equations uh, or these solutions uh, with respect to every one of these uh, 
parameters. And we do this for uh, both for the position and for the derivative. And uh, we would like to compare it to these uh, well, aforementioned uh, uh, equations which relate uh, initial and final data through these W operators. However, uh, we really want a covariant approach. And so we really want to connect uh, co covariant variations on both ends. And this means that when it comes to the derivatives of L, we need to take into account these, the, well, how the parallel, uh, how the covariant perturbation is done. Uh, but it is not something that complicated and uh, well, we can do this. Now in practice, uh, almost never, one has a solution of geodesic in such an explicit form. Instead, you have a number of uh, conserved quantities uh, generated by, uh, uh, by killing vectors, killing tensors, and uh, other similar uh, objects. And each of them gives you an, a conservation law in an uh, well, implicit form, so, which, may, which in general is uh, nonlinear in terms of all these variables. But, uh, so, uh, but it is not a problem because we only care about the uh, well, uh, derivatives. And we know that uh, the ordinary differentiation is a linear operation. Therefore, uh, whatever we get afterwards is a linear function in terms of the, uh, these perturbations. Uh, so in the end, this is just a problem of linear algebra. One has to invert uh, all these matrices in some sense. And again, uh, we still have to take into account the covariance. But uh, now, uh, having all these explicit relations, uh, we can write down the uh, components of these operators one by one by simply comparing uh, these derivatives uh, with these, well, the coefficients of the, in front of differentials on both sets of equations. And this approach uh, has, uh, was considered previously. Uh, so uh, there was some work by Bozhansky, but it was uh, slightly formulated in a different way using hamilton jacobi equations and, so and solutions thereof. Uh, but th this approach is, uh, we think, is much mo uh, more straightforward and it's very easy to treat it as an al algorithm. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is another, uh, let's call it pen and paper approach. So here uh, again, we start that we have a sufficiently symmetric space time. So again, we have these various killing vectors, tensors, etc. Uh, and now, uh, instead of uh, perturbing the geodesic equation or geodesic uh, solution, uh, we can actually write down integrals for the, uh, the deviation equation itself. So it happens that uh, from all these uh, killing uh, vectors and tensors, we can construct uh, solutions to devi deviation equation and these solutions then generate uh, conserved quantities and uh, again uh, having a sufficient number of such quantities uh, uh, we can integrate the equation fully and express everything in terms of metric coefficients uh, maybe some quadratures uh, maybe some conserved uh, quantities and uh, again uh, partial derivatives uh, with respect to these, these initial variations uh, give us uh, these operators component by component. However, uh, we said that it, we were dealing with this, with this problem in a coordinate uh, frame. And we know in general relativity that uh, due to diffeomorphism, diffeomorphism invariance, uh, there is, uh, it, it, one can affect uh, all these expressions without affecting physics by a pure change of coordinates. And uh, this is not what we want. What we want is to understand the physics of the space-time. Uh, therefore, we should really consider uh, the expressions not in the coordinate frame, but we should consider their projections on some physically motivated uh, frame. And uh, 
in our analysis, we find it very useful to use a so-called uh, seminal tetrad. So what is the seminal tetrad? Uh, it is a set of uh, four vectors. Uh, well, the last of them is the, the tangent to the null geodesic that uh, comes at us, at the observer. Then uh, we erect uh, two uh, orthonormal uh, space-like vectors, which are also orthogonal to L. And uh, these two vectors, in a sense, uh, well, span the screen uh, on, uh, on which we register the signal of light. So this can be a model of a very small patch on the sky or maybe a CCD plate. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the, uh, well, the screen that uh, would register this uh, light signals of light. And well, last but not least, uh, we also need, uh, well, we, we, we use the four velocity of the observer. And uh, well, on one hand, we needed to complete this uh, full set of uh, well, set of these uh, tetrad vectors. But on the other hand, uh, this four velocity will actually uh, allows us to uh, have a direct control over what is, uh, which effects are due to uh, the curvature of space time and which effects are simply due to peculiar motions. So at, at least we can see it better uh, uh, what depends on what. And uh, then of course, uh, Usually, people consider a parallel propagated frame. So uh, this again uh, can be uh, well it can be done exactly well. Uh, and th there are methods which uh, they either relate to uh, again uh, such uh, objects like a killing Yano tensor, but uh, in our case, in our uh, spherical symmetric space times, we'll see that. Uh, uh, we don't need that. We, we can simply use that, well, the geometric uh, properties of uh, the space time. And uh, what is the net effect of this uh, projection? Well, uh, after this projection, at least eight uh, components of each operator disappear. So already we simplify the problem uh, considerably. Uh, but uh, it's not all. We can do better if we choose, uh, well, when we choose a specific model. And now we switch to static spherically symmetric space times. So uh, why do we do this? Well, at first uh, it is uh, quite symmetric. It is quite rather easy to work with, but on the other hand, uh, well, it is also physically relevant. It, it, is, uh, it captures uh, all such solutions like of Einstein equations such as the well, the pure Schwarzschild black hole, or the Fresnel Nordstrom with electric charge, or we can have even some uh, cosmological models in suitable coordinates, uh, such as the De Sitter, uh, anti De Sitter universe, and uh, yes, any and any other uh, spherically symmetric compact object. So uh, yes, and so what else we can say is that. Uh, this spherical symmetry uh, will allow us to uh, exploit the central force problem approach, which means that now we don't have to consider geodesics in all over the space. Uh, this allows us to pick a plane uh, uh, where the whole, where the geodesic motion will be contained. So we reduce the dimensionality of the problem uh, without dealing with any uh, hidden symmetries. Uh, but uh, I want to just recall that uh, up to this point, uh, well, the Einstein equations or general relativity equations were, were not uh, were not were not used explicitly. I mean, we can use them, but so far this is purely a geometrical statement. So this would only also hold for uh, some other uh, theories of uh, gravity. And now, uh, so what happens when we uh, make this projection? So uh, of so for the, for the projection, uh, well, I told you that we have to pick these uh, four vectors and there is some freedom in choosing them, but uh, spherical symmetry suggests that uh, we can use, uh, we can span the spatial screen by two vectors of which one is uh, perpendicular to this plane and, uh, and while the other is lying completely in the plane. 
So uh, it means that uh, th there is no rotation of uh, this two-dimensional uh, plane, and uh, then uh, we, and also we again, as I said, we uh, avoid using any complicated uh, symmetries. And uh, so, what is the net effect? Is that uh, in addition to these uh, top and rightmost components, which were which were trivial, and these were the eight components that. Uh, uh, we could uh, set to trivial values at first. We now have also a few components inside the operator. So there are actually only five non-trivial components uh, per operator. Well, actually there are even a few fewer, uh, fewer of them uh, due to symplectic properties. Uh, the solution of deviation equation satisfies, but they are uh, non-linear, so we don't use them uh, in practice. So uh, after the projection, what do we see? We see that uh, actually the problem uh, decouples in, and decouples in the sense that, uh, as I told you, uh, uh, that there is a very uh, established formalism which deals only with uh, static effects. So these static, static effects are captured by this uh, two by two uh, sub matrix. So what, what I mean is that evolution of uh, these perturbations uh, with initial data such that uh, all of this is, uh, contained in this uh, static uh, problem. So th this allows us to study gravitational lensing effects, uh, not uh, taking care of anything what happens to uh, with four velocity or with these uh, uh, well peculiar vel velocity effects. They simply do not enter the gravitational, uh, standard gravitational <laughs> lensing uh, observables, such as these uh, uh, sizes uh, or inferred sizes on the sky. But we don't lose this, uh, this, uh, uh, these effects of power velocity. They're hidden in other three components, but uh, in our talk, in my talk, I will not discuss them uh, further. Uh, yes, so, <clears throat> so here now are a few examples of solutions uh, and their form. Uh, so here I only show these, uh, Components which are uh, important to this to these gravitational uh, lensing or light deflection effects, and we see that they depend on uh, well on the uh, coordinates or on the uh, initial data. Uh, depend on metric coefficients on both endpoints, and of course we have these uh, well we have these quadratures which uh, have uh, well they all there are other kinds of quadratures but they follow the similar very similar structure. There is a common kernel, and then there is maybe a, some metric coefficients missing or so. And yes, and also LR is the, the R component of the tangent factor of the null geodesic. So, well, it does not seem that bad. And also, it appears that there is a sort of uh, periodicity, but uh, I will explain this uh, slightly later. So, now we focus on the Schwarzschild problem. So we only consider the propagation of light in the Schwarzschild space time. And, uh, and we can say that uh, after we uh, substitute, uh, well, we can simplify this uh, geodesic system of geodesic equations uh, as one equation, the radial equation, uh, which has uh, the following uh, effective potential being the second term. And then, we can also, uh, and for null geodesics, it happens that well, really there's uh, maybe one or two uh, parameters, uh, well, really physical parameters in the problem. Uh, so, so if we fix our initial point that's infinity, for example, we are only left with uh, one parameter, and this one parameter would be the impact parameter, an impact parameter at infinity. Now, it doesn't mean that we cannot use it. Uh, as a start, in a starting point much closer to a black hole, but it's this, uh, well, one parameter that stands out. And depending on its value, we may, we may have weak deflections, uh, stronger deflections, maybe a turnaround loops. And uh, of course, eventually you may get uh, uh, your light either will uh, spiral towards the photon sphere or it will uh, be captured by the black hole, but we will not consider these two limiting cases. And uh, yes, and now our the question is, uh, what happens when a fixed observer, uh, a static observer, uh, uh, tries to uh, 
well, it, what it tries to study these effects. So, so now the problem is the following: we have uh, we have the observer fixed at, at in a fixed position, and all the time it will be the hundred ish words at radio position, and all the distances well, on the top panel are again measured uh, in units of Schwarz radii, while the bottom uh, uh, bottom panel is uh, dimensionless. And so what we do is we have a luminous uh, source of a unit size, and uh, we simply uh, put it along the geodesic. So for every impact parameter value, we define a geodesic, a null geodesic. And now what we do is we uh, put a source somewhere along this geodesic. And uh, so the question is, uh, what does the theory tell us? Uh, what, what should we expect to measure if the uh, luminous source is uh, positioned in, in a certain point corresponding to a certain geodes geodesic? So one impact parameter is very, well, uh, rather lar large. We don't really see anything interesting well, uh, what we see is that initially the distances are very close to each other, and well, eventually the parallax distance <coughs> uh, well starts growing a bit faster. But otherwise, this is a very uh, slow growth in difference. And uh, yes, that tells us why the, the parallax effects are usually treated in uh, well in very simple way. And and also we see that all the uh, functions or all the distances and the new parameter, uh, all they behave quite well. And yes, uh, now we reduce the impact parameter a bit more. So now it's only 14 Schwarzschild radii. And what we see, well, we start seeing something more interesting is that where well, the angular diameter distance uh, keeps growing uh, uh, indefinitely, but the parallax distance now uh, has to diverge somewhere. So it means that there is a point uh, where, uh, where if we placed our source, uh, it would look like that the source is, uh, its position is nailed. So meaning that if we had this family of uh, observers which span this uh, physical area, every each of them would see the, this uh, source in exactly the same uh, angular position. Uh, which is the well the, the reason well the, which is explained uh, by the convergence of these uh, lights excuse me one important thing this is true along one baseline uh, okay yes correct uh, along the yes so it is uh, so indeed uh, we have the two uh, orthogonal directions and uh, this effect is visible in the direction perpendicular to the plane. Indeed, uh, thank you for the comment. And uh, yes, what is more is that later the distance decreases and becomes smaller. So, and uh, there is at some point a, a point where all, both of distance measures are equal. Uh, yes, so, so this is for this case. Now, uh, if we reduce the parameter even more, and uh, well, now we are approaching the limiting values uh, step by step. So we see that uh, in addition to this divergence of the parallax distance, we also see that uh, at some other points, uh, both distance measures uh, vanish. So uh, this is where, uh, so, and this corresponds to the, uh, to the cases like, uh, like for example, the formation of Einstein ring. So these points are the these are the conjugate points where we see intense magnification of light, and uh, in, in here uh, well we see that th there is no we cannot infer any distance, and so also the functions uh, since they are defined in a, a positive way, so we only measure positive distances, uh, well the function is non-differentiable. But uh, again uh, after that point uh, the these. Uh, uh, well, these geodesics, uh, well, the distance measures, uh, again, start to grow, but uh, one becomes larger than the other. And so far for the new parameter, there is nothing much more. Now, uh, there's one more thing is that uh, also on the bottom panel, you see what you see is the values of affine parameter, which, uh, which label 
uh, well, steps or segments in this geodesic. And you see that uh, uh, the more, uh, the, the more uh, serious these effects are, the, the shorter the range is. So it is, uh, well, these effects are contained in a way. And finally, if, uh, if as the last subcase is, uh, if, uh, is the case when the light is deflected back at us, uh, so what we see is, well, the, there is nothing really new about the distance measures. Uh, we, we see similar effects repeated, uh, well, or, or maybe it's better to say we see different instances of similar effects. So again, we have divergences of the parallax distance. We have the vanishing of both distances. And uh, again, e eventually the distance, uh, well, the angular diameter distance uh, grows to infinity. But as for the parallax distance, well, it seems that it, it, it is growing, but maybe quite slowly. However, uh, I will argue that actually it is, it, it, it approaches a constant value. So for an uh, object infinitely far away, if we could see them, well, we would infer a finite parallax distance. And uh, here the last uh, well, interesting thing is that the mu is no longer uh, uh, monotonous, monotonous, monot monotonously increasing, uh, which, which happens in between these uh, well, points of the parallax divergence. And so now the, the question is, uh, we see that there are some uh, sort of three regions. We have initially very slow growth. Then we have in the middle, uh, very, uh, uh, well, serious, well, very serious effects, uh, uh, these divergences of distances. And then in the end, uh, we, again, we see a very, uh, very calm uh, behavior. So it, it seems that we should uh, try to study this in three different steps. So for this reason, it's really nice to introduce a bundle formalism. So uh, we can simply consider all these geodesics, uh, well, as a, well, we consider, we can consider a bundle of these geodesics. So in, in a sense, now we have a, a continuous uh, flow of non-intersected uh, curves or photons. And uh, in our problem, uh, these initial conditions can be, uh, restated as uh, initial conditions for this bundle. So in the case of uh, pure position displacement, uh, we call such a bundle an initially parallel bundle because uh, well, in an initially flat neighborhood, we, we assume that uh, these observers are, uh, well, they receive the lights uh, in such a way that uh, all, all these uh, geodesics are parallel to each other. On the other hand, uh, for the deviation in the, the pure deviation in directions, uh, we can consider a vertex bundle. So uh, there is only one observer, but its uh, observation covers well uh, it covers various uh, angular well it, it co covers geodesics coming from various angles from the sky. And what is nice about this bundle formalism is that. Uh, it has uh, a following quantity. Uh, well, so you consider a cross-sectional area, uh, cross-sectional area of this bundle as uh, uh, as uh, found by intersecting this bundle with a two-dimensional uh, uh, spatial plane. So this area, uh, of course, it evolves uh, along the geodesic, but it is a Lorentz invariant. So uh, it means that by studying its behavior, we can uh, say, uh, state some uh, facts without, uh, well, while preserving this uh, covariance nature. And uh, for example, for angular diameter distance, uh, well, this would correspond to this uh, vertex bundle because we have, uh, well, we need to see the angular size uh, of the source. And as for the parallel bundle, Actually, it measures, it is related to parameter mu. So why it is the case, uh, you may see later, but uh, well, this is what comes out. And uh, there's also the parallax distance, which is expressible uh, in terms of uh, areas of both bundles. So let's see. Uh, 
So we, you saw that uh, there were some special points along this uh, new geodesic where there was a convergence, divergence. And so uh, following the uh, usual standard terminology, we call the conjugate points uh, a point, what we call a conjugate point, a peak, a conjugate point with respect to the uh, point O. If this vertex bundle from O is uh, refocuses back at P, at least in one transverse direction. So if you, you have this uh, two dimensional bundle, at, what could, ha could happen is that either this bundle uh, collapses or uh, degenerates to a line, or in very special uh, conditions, it may degenerate to a point. But uh, more often, usually you have the degeneracy to a line. And then, uh, we also introduce a focal point, which is uh, less known, but uh, still it's not surprising that, uh, that such a point exists. So this is the point uh, where the bundle that starts in a, initially in a parallel way is, uh, well, is focused uh, into a point or a line. And uh, it, it, it happens that uh, yes, comparison of both these bundles are, that will uh, can tell us something about uh, these distance measures, and uh, of course what we see is that uh, the uh, the focal points usually appear before the corresponding conjugate points, and actually there, there is a sort of uh, freedom where one picks uh, up this uh, well, how these two points are displaced to each other. And then there is a third point called the uh, equidistance point, and this uh, is the point where both distance measures are the same. And this, uh, well, uh, uh, such a point corresponds to parameter mu, which is either equal to zero or two. And this ambiguity is due to this uh, sign I told you before. So now we have uh, now all the machinery, and uh, <coughs> we can explain it the initial region. So for, for the initial region, uh, well, if we are interested in parameter mu, and basically parameter mu it measures the difference between uh, both distance measures. So suppose uh, you have a, a, a vacuum. You, you only are working with a Schwarzschild, for example. So in equation 19, you see a Taylor series of uh, parameter mu. Uh, where each uh, coefficient is a rigid tensor contracted with the uh, with a null geodesic, or maybe it's derivatives, and everything is evaluated at this initial point. And well, the last term is uh, so-called uh, vial tensor, which uh, uh, which which is uh, present in principle even in the, in the app in the case of vacuum, like in the case of black holes or gravitational waves. So you see that if we neglect all these rigid terms, we, we have effect emerging only at the fourth power. So it is really, it takes a while for this to accumulate. And that's why we, their effects are seen so late. Now, on the other hand, uh, if we do have matter, Already at the second uh, power, we see some effects. And now uh, maybe some people uh, who are familiar with uh, these uh, so-called focusing theorems notice that there, there is this Ricci term which is related to the energy conditions. So, uh, so for now, it is just an approximate statement, but uh, later I will claim something uh, stronger. And Yes, so now we switch to the intermediate region. So in the intermediate region, what we have is that uh, we are solving this second order differential equation. And so you can, you can basically think of this as a parametric oscillator where the velocity is, uh, or this uh, frequency of oscillation is uh, changing uh, with respect to a fine parameter or, or with respect to some time. And uh, now this uh, term can be decomposed in terms of again a pure Ricci term and a pure vial term. So pure Ricci term is uh, matter effects, while vial term is uh, well this really uh, curvature coming from singularities or uh, gravitational waves. And in case of vacuum, we only have uh, vial contribution. And uh, one thing about this. Uh, object is that it is a traceless uh, operator, meaning that uh, 
since we so this only lives on the two dimensional space and if we take the trace over two dimensions well in a diagonalized case uh, we only have a sum of uh, two numbers and sim since we are solving two equations what we have is that we we have uh, two uh, oscillators one uh, having a positive frequency uh, real fre frequency and the other having imaginary frequency so what happens is that uh, in one uh, along one direction uh, we see an oscill oscillatory uh, behavior while in the other case there is this uh, exponential growth or decay in, in general now of course it depends on the initial conditions you supply and uh, but this can be uh, uh, this uh, oscillatory uh, behavior can be explained in more geometric way, meaning that all, every ge geodesic in the central force problem is contained in a plane. And now if we consider various uh, well, perturbations of the geodesic, well, all of them will uh, live on their own plane. And even though uh, this plane is tilted, but uh, still this plane must, uh, all these planes must uh, share the line which passes through uh, the uh, well, it, it has to go through the uh, center of the black hole and uh, then uh, well there is a line that all these planes share and in case for the this uh, uh, for the vertex bundle so in, in, in the case where the observer of, sees all the light uh, well it's not surprising that uh, there is a periodicity uh, of a period of a pi uh, because uh, the light has well it's, it diverges at the observer and it has to reconverge back on the same line and this the other end of the line is on the other side of the short black hole now uh, as for the other bundle for the uh, uh, parallel bundle uh, well instead we have uh, some uh, displacements uh, due to initial conditions so again everything is uh, all this focusing is contained on the line but now this line is uh, tilted away from the observer excuse me we have five minutes uh, five okay yes uh, so now we go to a faraway region so in the faraway region we assume basically that the curvature effects are negligible again and again we are solving this uh, second order uh, ordinary differential equation. However, now uh, now the initial conditions are well. We cannot uh, state them by choice. They, these conditions, in a sense, are uh, provided by the history of the propagation. So all the all these uh, coefficients or matrices of coefficients are well. They are arbitrary, but they are not as uh, simple as we had in the beginning. Therefore, now. For, uh, when you consider determinants, uh, well, you have at the leading order, uh, both of, you can see that both of them at the leading order have a quadratic uh, growth. And then when you go to distances, well, for angular diameter distance, we only we simply take the square root. So this way we have the lambda, the affine parameter. But for the parallax distance, well, it was defined through the ratio of these operators. So of course, when you divide square by square, well, you, you don't have, uh, you have nothing left. There are some other lower order terms, but as we approach infinity, they slowly uh, decay. So uh, all of this was uh, exact, but uh, well, sometimes it happens that by studying very simplistic exact solutions or problems, uh, you can notice that there are some more general statements. And actually, in, in this case, this uh, uh, this apparent energy condition actually can be generalized to a statement which does not hold in uh, which holds regardless of the symmetry of the space time. So, and this can actually be formulated as a theorem. So, again, consider a null geodesic and consider two points along this null geodesic, and uh, such that uh, one point lies in the causal future of the other and uh, assume the null energy condition. So null energy condition is the, the, the statement that uh, the contraction of Ricci tensor with uh, the null uh, tangent geodesic twice, uh, like if this contraction is non-negative, uh, then we call this con uh, case the null energy condition. 
And so what we can show is that, uh, okay, and also assuming that there are no singular points, so these bundles are not inverted at any point, what we have is that this parameter mu is uh, non negative. And uh, furthermore, if we ask when it is exactly zero, well, this is the case if and only if the whole uh, optical tidal tensor, so the whole contraction vanishes uh, along the geodesic. So it is zero for any point of the geodesic. And <clears throat> what you can see is that now, uh, suppose, suppose now that mu is for some reason is uh, decreasing. Well, this would be uh, something very weird. Well, uh, because all these conditions seem quite reasonable. So what could happen is that either the null energy condition is, uh, is uh, not satisfied, which means that we are dealing with uh, large contributions of uh, strange matter. Or on the other hand, that maybe null geodesics are actually not geodesics. And uh, they are, well, we have to consider the uh, optical medium effects possibly. And uh, then another uh, conclusion from this is that the parallax distance has to be always uh, larger or at least equal to the angular diameter distance. Again, for the same reasons, and uh, they are equal for all these, uh, for the, any point of this geodesic, if and only if uh, this uh, tri uh, transverse optical uh, tidal tensor vanishes again at any point of, uh, in between. So, so this is the end of the talk. I would like to conclude. So we see that our formalism, well, it, it, it's uh, rather simple. It is, uh, it's, uh, takes into account uh, all these various optical effects. It uh, allows us to have a better control over uh, special and general relativistic effects. And uh, yes, it's fully uh, covariant. It has relatively few assumptions. In, in principle, uh, Einstein equations are not uh, needed. Uh, and then we, we presented a couple of uh, methods of uh, exact solution generation. And uh, well, we discussed a bit what happens in Schwarzschild. And, uh, last, and lastly, we concluded a much more general statement, which holds regardless of any symmetries. And it's uh, well, almost on the level of these <laughs> classical uh, focusing theorems. So that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's time for questions. I have one trivial question. Why are your photons? travel from the observer to the source. Is there some reason for that? Uh, well, it's simply because in the cosmology, we, uh, well, we observe light coming from the past. So if we want to, uh, so it, it, in practice, it's simply better to reverse the time and uh, see how these uh, photons uh, propagate back to the source. It's ah. simply because it's, it has more use in cosmology. And the it's second question, convention. what is your plan to apply it to some observations? For example, to test which definition of the distance is better suited for real astrophysics? Yes, well, for real astrophysics, uh, I guess, uh, well, the luminosity des distance is the best. And I guess from then you can conclude the angular diameter distance. And as for parallax distance, well, it is really difficult to measure it. Uh, for example, suppose we, we could uh, measure it coming from the sources uh, placed at the other side of the Milky Way, then this uh, parameter mu would be of the order 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5, which is, uh, well, barely noticeable. Like maybe we can conclude with a systematic, uh, uh, we can say that there is some systematic bias, but not uh, an exact measurement. But uh, for example, this uh, test for, uh, for null energy condition, for example, well, this would be quite interesting because this is a statement of, about uh, the whole universe in principle. So, so yes, in plants, what we want is to uh, develop this formalism further and maybe classify, well, in some sense, classify this problem, maybe see, look for a sort of decomposition of the problem into some uh, simpler cases. So yes, of course, we would like to develop it further. Are there any more questions? I don't see any at the moment. So I, I guess uh, we can thank our speaker.